but in in today's climate it is uh it's uh it's it's kurosawa it's bergman i mean that's kind of where it is and scorsese has the uh has the great fortune to be still making films quality films while most other films and directors are pumping out drivel but the symbolism of the film is very interesting you know you know that i'd have to go there right the symbolism of the film is there. first of all the film itself is produced by by johnny depp he is the producer and johnny depp's production company is called infinitum nihil i'm like wow that's a really interesting name for a, a production company infinitum nihil which I believe, if if it's translated, uh, is uh, infinite nihilism or infinite destruction. Wrap your head around that. Interesting symbol for infinitum nihil, by the way. So the movie, uh, I'll give you the bare bones plot, and I won't give you any spoilers in case you want to see the film. But the movie takes place, I believe it's uh, just pre-World War II Paris. Paris is still recovering from the Great War, World War I. And there is a boy, and his name is Hugo. He's about uh, maybe 11, 12, just, you know, pre-adolescent. And he lives in a train station in Paris. And not only does he live there, but he is – he's – engaged in the he's in charge of maintaining the clocks at the train station now you ask yourself how does a little boy get the job of maintaining all the clocks in the train station in paris well what happens is that his father played by jude law is killed this is the one part of the film i am not clear on i'm just not clear on that part of the film because he's living with his father there's no mother Living with his father, his father is he works at a museum. And um while he's there, he finds this mechanical man. And the mechanical man is a central figure in the film. And I'll circle back to the mechanical man in a second. And he brings the mechanical man home and it, the mechanical man actually uh he has a key, wind up gears, all this incredible stuff, and he he actually can draw or write. That's what he does. And the mechanical arm moves into an inkwell and pulls the ink out and draws and draws and writes and writes. But it's one specific thing that it was tasked to do. Look, the gears have one function to create or recreate something again and again and again, a piece of paper. So he shows Hugo, this mechanical man, and then shortly thereafter, there's a very uh, intense event and he dies. Hugo is then taken by his uncle, Claude Cabret, played by Ray Winstone. What's interesting about this movie is that there's a movie called Sexy Beast. If you've never seen Sexy Beast, I highly recommend it. It's with Ben Kingsley, and Ben Kingsley plays the meanest, baddest, nastiest gangster you've ever seen in your life. And in Sexy Beast, he's he's uh, tasked with Getting Ray Winstone, who plays a retired gangster, out of retirement from Spain to do one final job. So they're in Sexy Beast together. Well, they show up again in this film, and Ray Winstone plays the the bad uncle, straight out of like you know Dickens, and um, he he's the guy that takes care of all the clocks at the train station. So he winds up living with his bad uncle, who's a drunk. And then the uncle just leaves for a while, and the kid has to take on the maintenance of the clocks himself. He's got nowhere else to go. He's been taught how to do this. So this is how he is able to uh, fix and keep everything running. Well, you have to suspend your belief for a second, okay? Because these clocks in the train stations uh, in, say, 1928-29, France are very sophisticated pieces of machinery, far more sophisticated than maybe a 12-year-old boy could maintain. But he does it, so you have to just kind of suspend your belief there. 
part of the part of the movie process. And while he's there, he's chased around by uh, the inspector general of the train station, played by Sasha Baron Cohen, aka Borat. And it's a cat and mouse game between he and Borat, or the inspector, and his dog. I think it's interesting that this movie would come out, right? That, And I'm not saying that this is intentional by any means. But this movie comes out, and it's about a boy who's quite capable of able uh, to take care of all the clocks in a train station in Paris. Meanwhile, Newt Gingrich is talking about creating or lessening the, the rules and restrictions for child labor laws. I'm not saying that the two are working hand in hand. Like, oh, here is Hugo. Oh, look at that boy. He's quite he's doing quite well for himself in that big train station by himself. Look at he's taking care of the whole train station. Oh, New Gingrich, he wants kids to be janitors. Well, Hugo can do it. Why can't our son, you know, handle some hydrochloric acid down at the uh the elementary school in his off hours. I'm not saying that that's really what happened, but if you think about it, the timing is interesting. You have you have to say the timing is interesting. So Hugo is uh, trying to. He's he's lonely. He has no father. He has no he has no mom. All he has is a mechanical man. A mechanical man, and the mechanical man, in many ways, becomes the savior of the movie. The mechanical man is a metaphor for Hugo. And through the mechanical man, he is he bonds with a toy maker who has a stall inside the train station. This toy maker is Ben Kingsley. And our friend Hugo had been stealing parts from the toy maker in order to keep his mechanical man running. And he gets busted early in the film by Ben Kingsley. And Ben Kingsley plays Georges Millet, who is uh, he's one of the, the great early filmmakers. And one of his films, uh, From the Man to the Moon, and I'm sure you've seen it. Everybody's seen it. It's a silent film. Um, it's about an excursion to the moon, and there's a giant cannon, and there's a like a, a giant bullet, which people climb into, and is shot to the moon, and it's fired off, and the moon is portrayed like a face, a man in the moon, and it hits the eye of the man in the moon, and starts dripping cheese, and of course the people get out, and they have this adventure on the moon with these these moon creatures. So, so that's an actual film. That's George Millet. And they show that uh, sequence on a number of occasions. Now, of course, this is the... Now, you talk about entrainment. Like, where does my head go when I watch this stuff now? It's like, you know, the, the giant shell, which contains the people, you know, hits the moon in one eye. And I'm like, oh, look at that. The moon only has one eye. That's a sign. That's the eye of Horus. Wow, this stuff goes all the way back to silent films and George Millet, and you know, there's the there's the there's the signature. And maybe it does. I don't know, but I, that's certainly I wound up seeing that scene. It's like, you know, Rihanna, Thrive, Man in the Moon, One Eye, George Millet's film. So the mechanical boy, the mechanical creature. In, in Hugo, to me, is a symbol of the transhumanist agenda. And this part I'm very clear about. Because it is, it is consonant with what we see in terms of our media, especially with kids, and the relationship between kids and mechanical beings, right? Look at uh, let's see what's what's uh, Ro Ro Robo Jocks, which failed. Thank God, it was a dismal failure with uh, Hugh Jackman, and it was like Rock'em Sock'em Robots, only with 
you know, like heavyweight boxers. Like this is how the future would evolve. You'd have robots and people operating the robots, right? Fighting each other, but not really fighting each other. It'd be the robots fighting each other, robojocks. There's that, and then there's, you know, all of the Optimus Prime and, and Transformer material where, you know, the kids are being indoctrinated into loving relationships with machines. And these are all future forward kind of models of that relationship with machines. Well, Hugo is a look backwards and still a loving, devotional, and warm rendition of a boy's relationship to a machine. And what's fascinating is, is that if you um, go far enough back, you'll see that Jude Law, who plays very briefly Hugo's father in, in Hugo, uh, is in a film called AI, which was directed by Steven Spielberg. And in AI, he plays uh, an automaton. He plays an android who is who befriends a little boy. So Jude Law has this very interesting relationship between AI and, and also Hugo, because in some ways, the mechanical man in Hugo is a very early rendition in form of AI. And AI, by the way, is what was, was set to be Stanley Kubrick's masterpiece. That was the film that he was working on after Eyes Wide Shut. He was working on both of them kind of concurrently. And AI was going to be Kubrick's exposition on the emergent world of artificial intelligence. It would have been the bookend, really, between 2001 and AI. Because in 2001, he really delves into artificial intelligence with HAL 2000, right? And we could spend a whole show talking about HAL and you know, what HAL means and how HAL is more human than, than most of the people in 2001. And you know, I think what Kubrick was, was saying or was trying to say or was going to say about AI is that we're being turned into robots, both literally and figuratively. But that is our future. And what happens, he dies. And who takes over AI? Steven Spielberg. What's he turn it into? Turns it into uh, futuristic Pinocchio. Futuristic Pinocchio tale. And that's another, by the way, another theme that I'm sure Kubrick would have explored. Pedophilia. And if you ever want to get into pedophilia, just read Pinocchio. To pedophile. What, I mean, what do, you, what do you think Pinocchio is about? Pinocchio is about pedophilia. It's about a guy who can create a boy all of his own. So this is, I think this is kind of where Kubrick was going, and of course, he never was able to make that. And AI is not a, it's not a very good movie. Had Kubrick made it, it would have been a terrific movie. And it really would have been the capstone on his career, and I think he would have been able to draw out a map. But alas, Stanley Kubrick got a little too close to the truth. The day after the release of Eyes Wide Shut, Stanley Kubrick died. And in fact, he had a director's cut version, which was the version that was going to be released to the public, which was edited. And certain key scenes were left out. Yeah, certain key scenes were the were the uh, sex scenes. There was full frontal nudity and all kinds of stuff. I've seen the original scenes. You, you, they had them in Europe, but I, I'm sure that there are other, a few other key scenes that were left out and eyes wide shut. 